Hello, welcome to Scary Thoughts, Horror, Philosophy, Culture. I'm Mark Kate. And I'm Chad Lott. This is episode 44. We're going to be talking about Catherine Bigelow's 1987 film, Near Dark. Spoilers ahead, see the movie first, then come back and listen. Little warning, our next episode is going to be about Mandy, the movie that came out just earlier this year. I'm very excited to be talking about that one. Yeah, I'm still kind of like processing Mandy. Like I watched it and at first I wanted to kind of hate it. I was like, ah, this is try hard. And then the more I thought about it and the more I looked at it, the more I really, really liked it. By the time I woke up the next morning, I was kind of in love with it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You can sign up for our newsletter. Go to scarythoughts.org and we will keep you abreast of future episodes little extra content, recommendations, and email us at whatthe at scarythoughts.org. And um, if you want us to address anything about Mandy or anything else at all, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I'm definitely curious to hear what people's experience with Mandy was. Not a lot of people have seen it. Um, they should. It's, yeah. wow, that's a hell of a movie. Yeah. All right, where do you want to start with Near Dark? Man, well, I guess I'll we could start a bit autobiographically. That's um, a good idea. I saw this movie in the early 90s and I loved it. I mean, it had a profound effect on my style of dress, uh, the kind of movies I liked. Uh, I've always loved Westerns. I've always loved vampire movies. And this is a Western vampire movie. And that sounds fucking stupid if you've never seen this movie. But if you've seen this movie, then you know it's pretty rad. It is. You know, it's funny. I um, I didn't see this movie at the time, but I did see its competitor that came out right almost at the exact same time, which is The Lost Boys, which we covered on another episode. And um, it didn't occur to me until today that it's a little bit like I'm the Lost Boys of this podcast and you're the near dark of this podcast. I'm totally into that. Right? Yeah. You know, because mine's got the Echo and the Bunny Men theme song and it's all California and, and brooding and goth. And yours is like Southern Gothic. Yeah. And it's a, it is a Western, you know? Yeah. Even the soundtrack, a little, you know, like this movie, it's mostly that Tangerine Dream soundtrack, which I could kind of take or leave. But it has that bar scene with the cramps and George Strait. And, yeah. you know, I just, I just love all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. All right. I want to talk about maybe at first the family, the mm. pack, yeah. which I think is really key to this movie that I don't think you would disagree if I said that actually the the main plot of this movie, which is a John Hughes love story, is kind of a throwaway. Caleb isn't actually that interesting, and May doesn't actually have much screen time. Mm -hmm. The fun of this movie is, I think, split between the fact that it's incredibly atmospheric. Yep. That's partly this, the Tangerine Dream soundtrack at its best. It has some terrible moments, but... At its best, it's just simmering and slow and brooding, which is an amazing counterpoint to these great action sequences that have so much character and dynamic. And that's all because you get so involved in this these weird characters, these, yeah. these agents of chaos that are caravanning through the South. Yeah, I mean, this is really Bill Paxton's movie. Oh, my you God. Know, he plays Severin, who is the... Uh, if it's a family unit of uh, Jesse Hooker, the patriarch of the family, and Diamondback, the mother, he's the, the older son, the older brother to Homer, and the older brother to May as the younger sister. And I mean, he has all the best lines. He's the most memorable character. I mean, I like I had like the same haircut. I had like a I wore like spurs on my combat boots for a minute. You know, I, I was very inspired by this character when I was younger. Oh, sure, and to a certain extent now. <laughs> what I also appreciate about this family dynamic is that one thing about your family is you don't get to choose them mm -hmm. and you're just stuck with them once you have it. And that's what this family sort of is, except in the end, it turns out you can actually get out of the family. But they are ragtag. They are scrappy. They are put together out of, even though there is a certain sort of nuclear family construction in mm -hmm. the characters... They are from very different times. They are very different characters. They 
express their lust for blood in very different ways. They all have very personalized techniques for, for finding food. Yeah. One of the lines that the character may says, she's like, don't think about it. It's just instinct. And it's interesting to think about this character set as, as a pack because they are prowling around at night. They are predators. They're, they're almost existing in a weird ecosystem that's outside of the mainstream. And, that's just really reflected in the scenery, the way they travel around. I mean, just the whole RV thing is so inventive and cool. Yeah. You know, like I, I think that's one of the things that is really added to this in the vampire genre by this film. Like before Dracula went across the sea in a castle or, you know, you see a lot of aristocratic vampires that all kind of have like castles or yep. high rises or something like that. They're all of means. These are the first just wild, free vampires that I, I can think of. Yeah. I mean, Hendrickson, who played, oh, what's the character's name? Jesse Hooker. Jesse Hooker uh, actually said he thought of them more as wolves, mm-hmm. which I see and makes this film feel, I think that's why maybe this film feels a little contemporary is the cultural focus on wolves mm-hmm. lately, not just by name. Beca- no, I'm not saying that just because he said it, but I think he's right. Yeah, it's like in this moment, like every protein shake guzzling Viking cosplayer has a wolf tattoo. Right. You know, okay. there, there's That's like what I'm a thinking. there's like a whole resurgence of this idea of pack, and you see, you know, there's these ideas of having a gang and starting a tribe. Like, you, there's all these weird weightlifting cults out there, and these like biker gangs slash fight clubs that are sort of reviving the idea of troops. And part of it uh, is really well articulated in Sebastian Younger's book uh, about tribes where you have a lot of this like returning veteran, the, the, like the post 9-11 veteran experience is very interesting because these veterans are returning to a society that has been soft for a very long time and it, it does not really know war. And you have all these people who are coming back who really know war and they only really have each other to talk to and experience it. And, and in some ways, this pack is a little bit like that, especially because Jesse Hooker is a, you know, famously, he fought on the side of the lost in the Civil War. You know, that's one of the best character he, development lines ever. He really is ever. a veteran. Yeah. yeah. And, and then depending on how you read some of their interviews, it, the character Severin is about his age maybe and was maybe turned because he reminded him of his son. Uh, we know they're probably at least, well, we know Jesse Hooker's at least as old as the Civil War. And they've probably been around as long as the Chicago Fire, which puts them in the early 1900s, like 1906, I think, is when the famous Chicago Fire happened. Mm. Uh, there's a scene when they're burning the RV and they say, remember that fire we started in Chicago? And that's one of the things that makes this movie so successful to me is how the story is told in these, and the characters are developed and described in these really minor interesting ways and a lot of the exposition about the characters is done through their clothing even the rules of the vampires are sort of explained through their clothing um there's a scene where jesse hooker's lying on the bed and you can see his revolver has a cross on the handle so you know that these aren't the type of vampires that are afraid of crosses and really um it is a new vampire mythology i think Catherine bigelow talked about how they intentionally threw away a lot of the old vampire story so that they could have something new. And I I think what she's developed is very successful. Yeah. Rather than go through the process of doing really heavy handed exposition, this film has so little exposition, Mm -hmm. but it's also that the blood transfusion, you don't get this ham fisted, like dad's a veterinarian. And that's how come he has Mm. these bottles and hoses and needles. It's just, you may or may not pick that up. Right. One of my favorite details about this movie and the non exposition, but it's in there nonetheless, is the fact that Jesse Hooker has the Confederate flag sewn to the inside of his duster. And in an interview with Hendrickson, he came up with the idea that that was the flag from the um, Confederate naval ship that he was on that was going down when he got turned. So he took the flag and keeps it on his body. Yeah, I, I don't often like to get into the whole like trivia surrounding the film, but it's so... Let's do it a little. But I think it, this in this particular case, it's not like saying like, oh, there's a... a you know, a little tchotchke on the desk and a character in Gremlins and it means blah, blah, blah. It's not, it's not that at all. It's not for nostalgic purposes. Uh, I think Catherine Bigelow 
really did a phenomenal job in casting this movie. And the three main vampires, uh, Severin, Jesse Hooker, and Diamondback, they all played together in Aliens. And they were already coming off of that film pretty tight. And that film is basically an ensemble war movie. And so they had developed this sort of vibe of being soldiers together. And they come right from that movie into this movie and they've already developed this history. And she really let them work through a lot of the backstory. And what I think is cool, they they did what uh, Quentin Tarantino famously does for his movies. There are all these rules and stories that the audience never, ever sees, but it's there and you can feel it. You know, like, so Jesse Hooker's whole backstory is that he was on a Confederate ship that was going down. And as he, as he was bleeding to death, some sort of vampire swamp creature comes out, bites him on the neck and he becomes the undead. And he's apparently from that point, just running around the South, like a badass vampire for the next 160 years or whatever. Uh, and then you see that story pops up in the preacher comic book. That's how the vampire Cassidy is bitten. Essentially. He's, he's part of the Irish Republican army and I don't know Irish history very well, but the, you know, the Republican war and he's bitten in that same way. And I wonder if like that story was known to the writers of preacher. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It, it, probably. Probably. I, yeah. I mean, I think these details are more than just, um, Easter eggs necessarily. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we're not talking about when you watch a, a Marvel movie, uh, that's part of the MCU and all like it's just so impregnated with mm-hmm. so many actually impregnated is a good because it feels like it's just splattered with the jizz of the entirety of the Marvel Cinematic yeah. Universe. It's just um, nostalgia bukkake all over the place. Exactly. Whereas this, it's not selling anything. It's just part of the thing in and of itself. Yeah, it's enriching the characters. Yeah. And like there's other things that are... I think with the characters and their look that really tell you a lot of the story. Like for example, uh, in some movies, vampires are just always the way they are forever. The moment they're turned, the fact that diamondback has roots in her blonde hair means that vampire hair grows. Right. You know, we we talked about something parallel to this when we, um, did what we do in the shadows, which addressed that to comedic effect is Mm -hmm. each of the vampires of the different generations. If you haven't seen that movie, listeners, good God. It's the only vampire movie I think is better than near dark, to be honest. I I agree. But each of the vampires in what we do in the shadows are sort of uh, culturally and aesthetically trapped in the year that they were turned Mm -hmm. in this movie. It's almost like they are mentally trapped in the age. And this is especially uh, noticeable with May and Homer because mm-hmm. May, who knows how old she Well, is she she's, only been she's turned in high four school years? And she's but, been turned four years previously. Okay, but she's definitely not grown up much in four years. I mean, she, she is full teenager. Yeah. And Homer acts like a little child. He's been around decades longer than, his, than he is a parent mm-hmm. to the eye but he's still just kind of this impetuous little kid. Am I using that right? Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, what, how did you describe him? You said he was like a... Oh, he's kind of a cross between Quentin Crisp and Christopher Hitchens. He's like like a child version of the two of them put together. Yeah, he's like a boozy little cretin. And there's just like interesting... His costume too has some really neat points to it. You know, he has the... Uh, like the 38 special, yep. which is, you know, basically all the other characters have like civil war weapons, but he has this kind of newer street urchin gun and he has the William Burroughs t-shirt on. Which is such a weird. Yeah. For, for To see a kid that age wearing a Burroughs shirt is strangely intense. But I do like, it, maybe because it's your field, talk about firearms because I did think it was interesting. Maybe I'm misperceiving, but each of them their character's choice of gun was very indicative of the character themselves. I mean, the most obvious thing is when you see Severin before he, he gets picked up by those two girls on their way to a hoedown or something. Mm -hmm. And he's just in the street playing with his guns in his, in his beautiful crisp white shirt. It's so obviously an expression, like his choice of weapons, these beautiful shiny six shooters, you know? Yeah. And to me, like that's kind of like, that's more of like an 1880s kind of thing. Like the whole idea, like the Buffalo Bill sideshow and Calamity Jane and all that stuff. Yeah. It's like, 
you imagine like Jesse Hooker's weaponry is a little more functional. He has like a newer firearm. He has like that forty five along with his uh, his cross emblazoned peacemaker, and then Diamondback is like more of a a knife carrying type she's got that she's always stabbing things in the background she's yeah, just like just, picking at furniture with her knife to yeah at the end of sentences and shit yeah it, it's it's pretty great but yeah like you know the idea that these vampires aren't killing people with their super fast speed you know they're obviously very strong but it seems like there's kind of a limit to their strength they're not like overly powered they're not even like true blood level power they solve their problems with guns most of the time. Yeah. Which is, to me, like, totally makes sense. Oh, certainly. Yeah. I think another thing, just going back to the idea of family, is that um, obviously so much of the vampire narrative, it's a, it's a cliche that the uh, protagonist is usually someone who's been turned and they have to confront whether or not they want to change their morality mm-hmm. in order to kill, and that's such a key component to this movie. So we have these vampires in Near Dark that are all just killing mercilessly all over the place except May because mm-hmm. we want her to succeed at the end. We want her to be human. But we she's don't want a her killer, though. I mean, she's she definitely is, but, a killer. But she's, def- but she's not as voracious about it. She's, she feels guilty about it, and she's not the one setting fire to things, shooting in the air, going woo, woo, woo after a kill. Mm-hmm. You know, they all, they all are, but not her. So she's a little closer to Caleb. Anyway, I just think that as a narrative device, it sort of makes her a little more forgivable. You know, a lot of movies, I actually just just watched From Dusk Till Dawn, and there's George Clooney and there's Quentin Tarantino. Mm-hmm. Tarantino is the, the murderous rapist, and George Clooney has rules. And so he survives to the end, and you can feel a little bit good about him, him being the antagonist who survives to the end because at least he wasn't as bad. And that's what yeah. May is, is you feel good for her because she, she kind of felt bad about killing, you know, it's just what you got to do. She didn't revel in it like the others. Yeah. You know, she wasn't at the bar eviscerating people and fucking with them. Right. She just danced with the boy and tried to serve him up to Caleb. Yeah. But, but the, the point I was trying to make is that this group has their own morality this family and that kind of reminded me of texas chainsaw massacre in a way yeah. you've got this it's family. All his family exactly yeah. yeah you've got this pack that has just completely created their own reality and they're they're just living by it you know yeah and they definitely like there's little hints that they probably have some sort of code right so mm-hmm. when they pull him into the rv for the first time they're just about to kill him he's like i'm gonna tear your face off like severin is just totally terrifying in that moment and She's like, he's been bit, he's been turned. Yep. And then all of a sudden they're like, well, tarnation. God like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> You're just like, what? <laughs> Obviously nothing can be done. And then they give him kind of like a probationary period. Like he like kind of prospects into their gang, which I, I think is kind of a, a fun way to, you know, they give him a week. And you wonder if like this vampire group, is there a larger vampire society out there? Like, are there rules that are enforced? Um, about not being able to kill your your kind or something like that. Right. And, you know, the other family dynamic that happens here is his, um, you know, his human family. You know, and the, the film opens where he's just like a bored kid hanging outside of a bar with his pickup truck and his loser friends. And he's, you know, he just looks up wistfully and he's like, wish, wish I may, wish I might, wish I was a thousand miles from here tonight. And it it's very, like, it's really childish, like small town kind of vibe. And his, you know, his father's a, you know, working veterinarian. So there, there's definitely a tie to the land. And then the little girl is a total a-hole. Like w- later on when she has a little more lines, like when Homer's trying to like bring her back in the hotel room, she's like, it's not polite to stare. And she gives him like all this sass. But the di- from the father and the sister's perspective, this movie is almost like an episode of intervention, you know, and there's a lot of like drug feel to yeah. this film, uh, in particular the scene where he's at the bus station and he looks like a junkie and he's sweating and he's already tried, he tries to eat the candy bar and he throws it up, which I think is a cool detail because that's kind of a historic vampire thing that, you know, they can't consume real food. Yeah. And, you know, they're looking for him and they want to bring him back home and they want to like reintegrate him back into their family, but he's gone off with what they probably assume are just criminals. You know, uh, one 
one thing I think was kind of fun for like a modern audience is when he gets picked up by the RV and it's just blasting through the desert. It's so similar to the opening scene in Breaking Bad where the RV is just crushing oh. through the desert and just throwing up sand behind it. And yeah, then yeah. it's like just empty skyline. It's, it's kind of a, I, it makes me wonder, did they, did they see this film? Was it any sort of inspiration? Right. There's no way to know, of course. Right. I think another thing that's interesting about this movie and the way it addresses vampirism is, um, I mean, you were talking about addiction and, uh, Martin is definitely a, a reference point there, but at least at that time, vampirism in cinema was always a power Mm -hmm. and vampires have vulnerabilities and it's always walked out in some idiosyncratic way from film to film. But in this movie and Martin and a couple others, vampirism is actually a hindrance. So this pack have all these obviously strengths and all that, but actually they live really raw yeah, And I think there's a bit of a chicken or egg to be talked about, about traditional vampires and aristocracy and class and, and longevity uh, accruing this sort mm. of historical nobility versus these nomadic skin of their teeth, skin of their fangs, mm. vampires. That they have all this power, but actually they're so at the mercy of, of the sun and discovery at all times. Yeah, they live a wild, precarious existence. And you imagine that as soon as cameras are everywhere, they would be fucked. Yes. You know, like you could not, like like the late 80s is probably the last time that you could even live that sort of lifestyle. And it has a bit of a parallel with like sexual freedom and culture. Like, you know, the mid to late 80s, that's the boom of AIDS. And that's kind of, you know, another blood disease. And it's almost like you could not live the same sort of wild, you know, early Motley Crue hedonism really much past 1987. Right. And that sort of lifestyle, it does give you, you know, like the rock and roll powers, you know, but it comes at a cost. And it may even says the night has its price, which I think is just, if you were to release this movie again and had a poster, I think that would be a great tagline for this movie. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a cool line. Like the dialogue in this movie, part of the dialogue is so great. And then other parts of it are just like straight yuck, yuck, you know, and all the goofy yuck it up lines are definitely from Bill Paxton. And he has, and then most of them, I guess, are improvised. Like when he's like, when he's biting the biker on the neck, he's like, I hate them when they ain't shaved. Yeah. And then, you know, he's like, it's finger looking good. And he tells them, you know, this guy smells like a pole cat. Like it's all these ideas that he actually brought in, like him and Lance, Hendrickson would drive around in their car in character, just like talking about stuff. And it it's weird. Like they almost had like a Daniel Day-Lewis level method acting for this yes. film. Uh, speaking of Daniel Day-Lewis, did you know he was the first pick to play uh, Louis in Interview with a Vampire? Yes. Yeah, it's such a weird, I wonder how that movie would have been. I just watched Interview for the Vamp- with a Vampire for the first time recently and I can't believe how terrible that fucking movie is. I want to I want to talk about Interview with a Vampire about something else in this movie. Yeah. But I I do want to say about as much as I love Bill Paxton in this movie, I think he just had like too many lines. Mm-hmm. And actually what you just said that that line from I hate him when they ain't shaved, finger licking good and then uh guy smells worse than a dead polecat or whatever. Yeah, and he has the joke. He's like, did I ever tell you the one about Buffalo Bill? And he puts right. his beer in his chin. I do not get that joke at oh, all. Oh, it's the beard, white beard. Like the head on the beer on the beer is left on his chin and he looks like Buffalo Bill because he's got the white stringy right. beard. I guess, but like, is that a joke? You know what I mean? <laughs> like it's, it's it's like, I don't get like, it right. actually is funny enough for the dude he's about to fight right. to stop and kind of chuckle. Which is great. Yeah. And you know, trivia, that dude that he's about to kill is the, uh, the Terminator kills him in the bar when he steals his clothes in Terminator 2. Oh. Yeah. It's interesting because that bar has the same kind of feel. And yeah. Look. Yeah. It's just like a nowhere biker bar. Poor guy. Yeah. But yeah, I think Bill Paxton, if he was just, uh, I wouldn't say dialed back from 11, but rather I I think it was just a little too much. And I think it took away from the potential of other characters. Like one of the best moments in Aliens is when Paxton turns to Jeanette Goldstein 
and says, hey, Vasquez, have you ever been mistaken for a woman? She goes, no, have you? That's a great moment. And mm. then you, immediately she like does the bro handshake with this other guy that you always see her next to in the background. Mm. They clearly got something going on. Like there's so much revolves around the characters and aliens on that moment. Yeah. She doesn't get any moments like that in this movie. Yeah. And I think it's because Bill Paxton was just Paxtoning it up so much. And, for, you know, it's not about fair. It's just that I feel like I wanted a little more from her knowing that she's got hella chops for, yeah. for character. You know, she's a great actress. Like, just the number, yeah. like, she plays Vasquez, like a tough, like Rosie Perez style military figure. Like yeah. I was like, wait, when I saw she was in aliens, I was like, well, who is she? And then I looked, yeah. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. I couldn't even believe Completely it. Completely transformed. Yeah. Totally amazing. And I, I kind of like, this is a little wink and nod, but I kind of like when they pass the movie marquee and it says aliens. So cute. It is adorable <laughs> for this film, but I, I agree. It's not that I, I think I'm on, I'm with you on this. It's not that I want less Bill Paxton. I just want more of those other characters. Right. You know, like even and like I could watch a Jesse Hooker movie, you know, oh, all day. And they, they even talked about uh, right when they finished filming it, they all had such a good experience filming this. They're like, let's make the prequel. And this is an age when there weren't really prequels, you know, and they were the mm. prequel as they kind of walked it out was going to be called First Light. And it was about them post Civil War, which I think, man, if I could just put all those you know, bring all those characters back to their prime and let them do that film now, I For would sure. love to see that. I'd love to see a graphic novel about that if somebody would make that. I think that would just be well, so Hendrickson badass. Well, Hendrickson made a graphic novel. Isn't it based around Near Dark? I, uh, man, this is the first I'm hearing of it. Okay. We'll, yeah. have to, we'll have to dig into that. Okay. I want to talk about Homer, mm -hmm. the young boy, young in quotes. Yep. And incel culture. Yep. Actually, you'd probably be better to explain incels to our listeners. Well, you know, I honestly don't really know that much about it. Like, okay. as far as I understand it, it's this internet-based subculture of unfuckable losers who've taken on this mantle of incel, which is short for involuntary celibate. And they've just basically turned their uh, inability to have sex with women into this insanely misogynistic culture that is about as toxic as it gets from what I can tell. Yeah. I think something that is weird about this movie and not walked out. Well, there are two things that make me bristle, make my feminism bristle. One is that at the very beginning, May is screaming, take me home, take me home, take me home. Mm -hmm. And he just pulls the keys out of the car and he's like, you got to kiss me first fuck you you borderline rapist yeah it's a creepy asshole. move it's really gross yeah i was i was thinking about that scene a lot um because the way they meet right is, is kind of funny like she's outside licking an ice cream comb and we know that vampires can't eat food so this is clearly she's trying to attract these dudes and she's basically attracted that kind of dude right so she's for the sake of like feeding sort of purposely attracted that dude and this is i know that this is very loaded territory but she's literally sort of asking for it um and again like i totally get that this sounds terrible so stick with me for a second she's kind of created the character of someone who is asking for it you know and you know, she has like a her rope belt which is hilarious she just looks like a hot generic trailer trash person and then he comes up to her and he's like flirting with her and he's like Oh, can I get a bite? She's like, a bite? And then he's like, I just, I'm just dying for a cone. And she's like, dying? And so there's like this weird playfulness where she's like almost playing with her food. <laughs> and so for sure, fuck that guy, right? It's a creeptastic move. It's lame. And also you realize the fact that she could burst in flames and fucking die. Like the stakes are higher. She, of course, she's about to eat him. So sort of square on that. <laughs> um, but it's one of the things that really made me think about like, why would she have turned him? Like he pulls this douchebag move on her, doesn't care really what seems to happen to her. And, but she also kind of falls for him in that moment. And it's like really kind of weird. Like that's the moment she actually, she actually does give in and kiss him. His, so his technique sort of works. And I don't really know what to think about that or like how to feel about it in this film. Like it, it's like, I wonder, was that just, how people picked up people in the eighties in Oklahoma, you know, I don't know. It seems like to our modern eyes, 
almost like beating somebody over the head with a club and dragging them back to your cave. You know, it has that kind of feel to it. Kinda. Yeah. But he's also a ranch. He's a legit ranch hand cowboy. He is a roughneck. He's not a, a smooth character. So I don't know. Do you interrogate that character with modern eyes or like, I, I don't know what's uh, not fair to the character is not what I'm saying, but like, I don't think it's about smooth. I think it's about respecting a woman as a human being mm-hmm. who, when she says, when she screams, take me home and you offered you don't do it and you put basically sex between a person and your obligation to them. It's super fucked up, undeniably. It, it's, right? like, like, it's like fucked up no matter what millennium you're living in. Yeah. But I think what I'm getting at is like it's supposed to be telling you about the character a little bit, right? And where I think one of the reasons why it stands out is so weird is like he pulls that move, but then he's so soft afterwards. Like yes. he's like kind of a sensitive guy. So you're – like, okay, was it, like, just enough of assholery for her to be interested because she's kind of, like, Severn? Like, because, I mean, you imagine, like, she, she lives with the, smoke, the biggest psycho in the planet, you know? Like, a dude who, like, cuts people's neck with the spurs of his boots and yeah. does all this terrible shit. So you wonder, like, her tolerance for that must be so high, you know? And she lives with weird Homer, and to get back to him, like, the the scene where you, like, he kind of introduces himself to Caleb is so weird. He, like, grabs Caleb's dick which is totally bizarre, and then get, spells out his name and is like, don't you mispronounce it? And I'm like, well, how would you mispronounce it? And then Severin calls him Boner for the, the whole movie. Oh, I didn't yeah. catch that. Yeah, it took me a while to kind of get it. I was like, what the fuck is this even about? I don't get it. The other thing that's inconsistent about the scene of Caleb driving May home or not driving her home is that she was about to die. She could easily have just killed him taken the truck and right. driven herself well there's a lot that's inconsistent about this movie like near yes. the end where it's like it's pitch black outside it's early enough in the evening for the little girl to be out getting a coke and then the the tv the flag and the anthem plays which i believe used to be at midnight right yeah that, that so you go from midnight and then 10 minutes later the sun comes up yeah and you're like what's Oops. going on here continuity guys but let's let's get back to the thing about Homer is and so I, I don't quite know where you're going. Oh with no, this. it's like a rev- well. Okay, so the thing about Homer is that he turned May mm-hmm. for companionship, right? But when he describes it, and I I don't remember the screenplay exactly, but he basically claims that she was mine, mm-hmm. and like Caleb stole her, like she's property, right? And she's going to turn Caleb's sister because he needs his own. Mm-hmm. Like, you took her. Now I'm going to take your sister. Right. Um, it says even Stevens. Even which Stevens. Is such a childish way of describing it. <laughs> yes. And so he's basically believes that he deserves a woman as a piece of property. And that is the language of incels. If you look on in cell forums, that is how they regard women. They, women are something that are taken from them mm-hmm. by who they describe as, sorry, chads. Yeah. Uh, women are taken it's by chads. It's the funniest thing to me. It's like, like my name is like now like a bro culture enemy. It's amazing. Which is totally, because if I knew any fucking incels, I would shove those bitches right in lockers, man, like fucking <laughs> dorks. <laughs> um, what's also odd about Homer is that he has the body and mind of a child, but he's grown up and acting to regard women as a really fucked up adult would. Mm -hmm. He's not going to have sex with them, but he's treating women as an adult misogynist would treat women, Mm -hmm. not as a tween misogynist would treat women, which is odd because yeah, he's not, he's not going to fuck them. He can't. His equipment doesn't work yet, but he's still acting like a rapist, essentially. Yeah, yeah it's 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 like more of yeah. I don't. I mean, I'm sure all these are all psychologically tied, but it's definitely more of like a possessive thing. And you know, and then if you want to get all Freudian, like his mom is Diamondback, and she treats him like a child, like she scolds him like he's a child. But Jesse Hooker calls him old man. He's like, get it together, old man. And like, kind of expects more of him. It's like he has more of a realistic experience of what he is 
more so than anybody else does. And then Severin just bullies him the whole time. I love the scene where he jumps on top of the car and he's handing him the bicycle and he's like, just throws it at him on the ground, just in total disdain. And they're bickering and they're arguing about, you know, hearing about him being stuck in a young child's body. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. No, it it is super fascinating. And that's what made me rewatch or watch. I think I tried to watch Interview with a Vampire at some mm-hmm. point and shut it off 15 minutes in because it was so intolerable, but decided to power through it this time. And part of it is, I think this is something you pointed out, is that there is something very, very uncomfortable about, okay, we don't really sexualize children in Hollywood movies much. There are exceptions in some European films. God, there are exceptions all over the place. But, you know, you kind of just don't do it, right? But what happens when the child is the sexual aggressor because they're a vampire and are older than their body? Right. Betrays. So Kristen Dunst in Interview with a Vampire sort of has this sexuality and sexual relationship with... um, Louis. Louis. And that's really fucking weird and hard to deal with. And Homer is sort of an extension of that, right? Is this tween body is acting like a sexually depraved adult. Yeah. I mean, this is all just like textbook Freud, you know, like the, you know, the psychosexual attraction to the parent, you know, the idea that, you know, the whole Oedipal complex that the, the son is actually attracted to the mother and wants to kill the father because he's taking from him. And then there's this profound fear that happens. The first and then Freud writes about like how there's like a profound fear the first time a young child sees his father's penis because it like basically he now feels inadequate and can't satisfy the mother. I don't totally buy any of this Freud shit. I don't even understand. I don't know how modern psychologists interpret it, but I know that culturally these ideas have like literary weight. You know, you see them pop up in, in film and literature all the time, and they're they're very heavy-handed in this film. Yeah. And there definitely is something unsettling about a child acting like an adult in any way. You know, he, even movies where, like, like The Sixth Sense, the fact that the little kid is pretty put together is kind of creepy. Um, <sighs> but there's a weird, like, the act, one of our uh, listeners pointed out on Instagram, they said, you know, this is one of the most underrated child performances of all time. And I agree, like he has like a real sleaze to him that's really just overt and they, it's just yes. like a dirty character. Well, my reference to Quentin Crisp and Christopher Hitchens is more based on his performance in Teen Witch than in this movie. Have you seen mm-hmm. Teen Witch? No. It's, I don't even know how to describe it. It's uh, sort of like if Clueless was a musical, but 80s, not 90s. And he plays this like foppish over it queen, but he's the little brother, Mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, in 16 Candles, the younger brother. Yeah. It's like that, but him. Yeah. That's kind of an eighties character. uh, Like the character, like in just one of the guys, she has the over sexualized younger brother who in that movie is like, I don't know, like 14 or 15 years old. And he's just all about vag i mean he has his whole room is completely covered in and pornographic images and he's just constantly trying to get laid the whole time and it's kind of interesting how in that movie that movie and other movies like the foppish younger brother was sort of a thing in the 80s like and but also kind of weirdly stylish and in some ways like you read like you know, I don't think William Burroughs was ever cooler than in the mid eighties, you know, when he's running around with Patty Smith, he was definitely a beat figure, but he sort of survived through. And that's when he's becoming more of a visual artist. So he's definitely at that point, like living in the East village and is a character of cool. So like, I can't imagine Jesse Hooker reading William Burroughs, you know, Caleb definitely fucking barely knows anything outside of Oklahoma. May is clearly totally ignorant to everything outside of a trailer park. And so he is probably the coolest of the characters, like in, in as far as like modern, but he's, you know, a, still looks like a child. It's so weird. And like when you said he looked like Christopher Hitchens, I mean, he really looks like Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> yeah. He just looks like boozy and bloated, but he's 12. 
to the point where in the bar, the bartender sir or the bar waitress serves him. Like there's no card, no ID or anything like that. Right. But I get, let's talk about the bar scene. This is probably the most famous scene of, of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that what is cool about the bar scene is an extension of what is cool about this whole movie is that it is actually really slow. The mm. bar scene has amazing moments of violence, but there's just a lot of sort of slow dancing and watching yeah. and there's a lot of space and it makes the violence far more uh, far more violent and I, that's something that you know actually another vampire film but uh, let the right one in mm-hmm. really pushes to extremes and I really appreciate that is it's just like nothing happens nothing happens nothing happens some horrifying unspeakable act of violence happens and then they just keep moving forward yeah. You know, and they arrive at the bar on foot too. And there's like that really cool scene of them. It's a silhouette of them. It's a high contrast, but a very smoky shot where they're walking over the ridge and it's the five of them. And they're sort of arranged oh, yeah. in order of age, kind of like if you look at the, if, if you look at the silhouette and they walk into this bar. And to me, one of the things that's kind of peculiar about that scene is they are of the South, you know, like they're Southern vampires, but they come in and they have like kind of this disdain for like the, he calls it like shit kicker heaven. And he, he's just really playing up a lot of the, the tropes of the bar. Like he's like, yeah, you know, you got watered down beer and this asshole over here is playing pool and you know, you're a dumb redneck and I'm going to make fun of you. It's, it's like he, he becomes superior in that moment, even though he's, he's of the South just as much as they are. Right. But yeah. you know, you can imagine going to the version of the thing you are, but a lesser version and mocking all the things that are part of your culture, yeah. but the worst parts of your culture. Yeah. You know, that seems fun too. Cause it's almost like when like it brings back that wolf predator thing, like they're when like mother cats teach kittens how to hunt by like playing with them and like, they'll like hobble a bird and then let the kitten learn. It has that feel. They're like trying to teach him how to hunt, but he kind of rejects it. And it's, it's so odd to me that that character has that weird moral center. Like he doesn't want to hunt. He doesn't want to kill. It, it, it seems a little bit out of place. Cause I feel like within like 14 minutes, I would have killed somebody and joined that gang. If I was him, (laughs) you know, I think that another thing that works about that scene in this film in general is that an expression we've bandied about throughout this podcast is villainous trifling, Mm -hmm. you know, to talk about when the, the killer, the bad guy just seems to take way too fucking long. They just waste time. And oftentimes it's, it is their undoing. Mm -hmm. Most horror movies have a degree of villainous trifling. Most horror movies the serial killer taunts and plays with or disappear, mm-hmm. you know, like, let's just say Halloween, you know, yeah. like how much wasted time does Mike Myers, uh, Michael Myers spend instead of just getting to the killing, right? There's yeah. no epic plan really. But this movie, what you've got is this pack that are like performing for each other. Mm-hmm. So rather than showing up at this bar and just laying waste to everybody eating and moving on like you would at a normal fucking restaurant. They just collectively revel in the violence Mm -hmm. and it makes it far more interesting. Um, And you get more from the characters through those moments. You know, again, in particular, Bill Paxton and his, his witty lines, him not just going and mowing people down gives us an opportunity to learn more about that character yep. and learn more about what they think of his char- what his family thinks of his character and vice versa. You know, how do they all relate to each other? Well, this is what they do. This is them in their, in their moment mm-hmm. is they just go around and fuck with people and kill them. I mean, uh, Diamondback and Hooker, when they get held up, they're just totally fucking with They're those stoked. kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's just going exactly how they want to. Yeah. I, I think the the various people that they kill, instead of just being like generic characters that they kill and there's no, you know, there's no real reason for it. Like in a, you know, Friday the 13th movie, it says nothing about Jason that he kills, you know, some girl with an arrow uh, and laying in bed or something. Like it doesn't, it doesn't tell you anything more about Jason. Right. But the way that these characters kill their prey 
it tells you everything about their characters. Like, you know, Homer is laying in the street pretending like he's been run over and he's on his bicycle and he preys on people who come to take care of him, which is in some ways the worst, you know, because yeah. these people will come over and they're like, oh my God, I need to help you. And then he turns on them. And then, you know, Jesse Hooker and Diamondback, they're a little tougher and they're out and they stop and pick up some hitchhikers, these weird hitchhikers who happen to like rob them. And you have to have the idea that, he must have known that the other character is there because their senses are heightened. Do you, and you know their senses are heightened because there's a scene where Severn says, get up, I know you're awake, I can smell it. Right. You know, and so, so they have at least enough ability. And then he also is able to put a bullet in the driver of the uh, 18-wheeler's face from like 150 feet away with a six-shooter. Yeah. Nearly impossible. I mean, that would be almost impossible sure. to do. Um, Unless you have centuries to practice the art (laughs) that's the thing too that's one of the things i think about and you have vampire senses yeah yeah i mean i'm just saying like it's not impossible for him but i think what's really cool about this movie is unlike in the lost boys where the girl who's like the love interest hasn't killed someone yet and she could still be redeemed may is a killer and i think that makes her way more interesting than star in the lost boys yeah and it, it's like their their level of violence. I, I think the level of violence of these vampires is far higher than the level of violence of the characters in Lost Boys. And the violence is is pretty ugly. Yeah, I mean it's not fully gory necessarily, but it's it's definitely very ugly. It's not it's not scrubbed like a lot of the Lost Boys violence is. Yeah, and then like the characters in Lost Boys, they're like sort of like hunting other rebels in the outskirts. You know, they kill that that band of punk rockers that are like dancing around the fire, listening to walk this way, which is like what no punk Made rockers no would be listening to yeah. at that time. I mean, maybe, I don't know. I wasn't there, but the, the violence of the near dark vampires is very Americanized. And I think the, the, the presence of pistols and tools of the old West give this, you know, what I think Harold Bloom calls the grotesque violence of the South when he's talking about blood Meridian that you're dealing with in some ways a more realistic violence, like because they're using guns, because they're using the highways and byways of America to kill, like, you know, they're murdering hitchhikers. That's a thing, you know, like the, the guy who Michael read, I think is his name that co-wrote this film, the, the book that he, or the movie he wrote right before this was the hitchhiker, which is like a classic thriller about, you know, a murderous hitchhiker. And those at that time, I think those were the fears of America and like, the presence of pit, like I can't think of other than like newer vampire movies like Underworld, like guns were never a thing for vampires before this movie, right? Yeah. Speaking of how punks in The Lost Boys would never be listening to Walk This Way, that bar would not have the cramps on the jukebox. No, no yeah. way. Yeah. That Although would... it was fucking perfect, like I can't fault the filmmakers for using that song because it worked so well but nah yeah because no i mean it's basically like a drag number for bill paxton you it know is. i mean it comes on <laughs> and it's like yes. and, you know he there he is he, it, it's his show he's on a stage and then but the tone shift to that george Strait cowboy walks away it's like if you took that single shot of her walking up to that cowboy it is like a really beautiful, sad moment. I mean, it, it it's the lyrics are just so, so sad too. You know, it's like you know, my heart's sinking like a setting sun. I mean, it, it's just a, like a really beautiful song, and this slow dance in a dive bar, this like romance in a dive bar, just seems so, just lost and full of ennui and sadness, and you know, Caleb ultimately fails and his his weakness sort of sets in motion the the next most iconic scene in the movie which is the gunfight at the hotel which is just such a cool and inventive scene yeah it looks beautiful yeah like the whole like sunlight through bullet holes thing i think the first time anybody does it uh, the coen brothers do it in blood simple Mm. which came out like three years before that there's a gunfight and there's like light coming through but to use the sunlight as a weapon is just so cool. And yeah. especially the scene where Severn shoots the cop through the door and the cop gets blown back, but the sunlight blows him back. Yeah. It's such a really like unique, interesting idea. Absolutely. There are two other uh, anomalies in this movie 
that sort of anomalies or mistakes? Uh, anom. Well, uh, neither. Mm-hmm. Uh, problems. Mm-hmm. One is the black truck driver. Mm-hmm. Is such a minstrel show caricature of a black character. He just won't stop laughing at any point. He's just like bouncing around and laughing, and nobody's laughing with him, and he's just like in his own world yeah. and it's really uncomfortable he's he's the worst caricature of anything in this movie yeah. and it's really like especially when when caleb is clearly like dying or something and the guy's like back 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 ha 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 black black ha, ha, ha. see i didn't like, take it as a racial Jesus. i thought it was like more like um it was more of a trucker stereotype like mm. he's all trucker speeded up that's kind of how i read it. it was like he was just super high on trucker <laughs> speed and yeah. You know, he's just this unstable character because there were some scary highway movies. There was like in, in the eighties, there's Maximum Overdrive. You know, there's, <laughs> there's this idea of, uh, and then over the top <laughs> with Sylvester Stallone. Oh Jesus! So like truckers in the eighties were a little bit more of a presence in film than they right. are now. Uh, so I guess I could see where, like, he's the only black character in the movie. So I think now, like in this moment, now you look at that character and you're like oh, well, it's a problematic black character. To me, I read it just as more of a, like a trucker. But there's, but uh, okay, possibly, yeah. but there's nothing else in this movie like that. Well, okay, so this is another, I think the reason why this character is so tuned up is because he's literally driving a Chekhov's gun, right? He is telling Caleb how to drive the truck, which is how he learns how to jackknife the truck to kill Severn at the end of the sure. film. And, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe it is a problematic character. I just, I didn't read it that way. I think because I was so much more attuned to what's happening with May and if she would kill him. And then, right. it, it, and again, like this is the second most fucked up death, I think, because ultimately he, even though he is laughing at Caleb, he does kind of try to like, he's there to help. Yes. You know, and then May kills him. And then. Not cool, May. Yeah, not cool, May. And then. Caleb again demonstrates his absolute fucking lameness because he he can't kill, but then he's willing to kind of third party enjoy the blood. To me, yes. it's like people who are like squeamish. he's a parasite. Yeah, it's like people who are squeamish about hunting, but they'll eat meat. Like is the fucking lamest. You know, look if if animal death bothers you, you kind of need to go vegetarian. You know, in in this case, although he dies if he doesn't eat the food for whatever reason. But speaking of dying from not drinking blood or drinking blood, my favorite shot, like from a cinematography perspective, is immediately after this, which is in the oil field with all that heat lightning blasting. Beautiful. And there's so much to read in that scene. He's drinking her blood and it just, it's striking looking, right? But then there's kind of an environmental message in there a little bit because, you know, the oil is pumping the blood of the earth out of it. And she yep. says, if you drink too much, I could die. And I was like, oh, it's kind of a global warming message snuck, <laughs> stuck into this. But again, that's kind of a uh, a modern thing that you're uh, adding onto this film. But it's such a cool shot. I love the texture of this film. Yeah. Uh, you know, it has like all the blacks. They're not dark, dark, deep fall into them black like in the movie 7. They're like flat, almost like chalkboard black. And that gives this whole movie... Well, it's, because, it, it's the dust. Yeah, it's the dust. Yeah. And it, it gives this movie like a stage-like quality. Like it feels like a set a lot of times, yeah. even though it's all location shots. Or it's, also very, location. it's also very close quarters. You know, you spend yeah. a lot of time in this Winnebago or this truck that you yeah. can't see outside the windows. Yeah. You know, you're not getting these... Uh, oftentimes, you're not getting these panoramic scenes you're getting a bunch of people cramped in a room that they're trying to make as dark as possible yeah a lot of the shots are really cramped and crowded and even when they're outside the camera is very tight on the characters you know so even though there's this presumably gigantic oklahoma or texas sky it's still kind of tight and i think that does a good job of making the like their life is very honed in like they're not like able to do very much like there's the whole thing about her little soliloquy she's like you know that the light from that star is gonna is five billion years away and i'll be here when it gets here you know and part of me is like well if you keep living like an asshole you're not you're eventually (laughs) gonna get killed uh but the other part is caleb says well what do we do now she says anything we want to do but no they're not even on youtube you know they're not even like the youtube star level interesting you know they're like 
all they do is ride around and kill. It, so it's essentially like all like imagine if all you did was just go around to eat. That's literally all you did was like eat in a really messy way. Like you go into McDonald's, just smash a cheeseburger on your face, eat a quarter of it and run off to the next burger place and smash some fries on your face. And it, it, it's like they don't really have very much that they can do. Yeah. The other problem mm. is that the conclusion of this movie is totally predicated on the idea that an infection that you can get from just, just a nick just just a mosquito amount of contact with a vampire mm-hmm. can turn you, but a blood transfusion can cure you. Yeah, it's super stupid. It, I wish they spent a little more time figuring out how to devampirize. Yeah, I mean, Lost Boys, I think, does a little bit of a cleaner job of this by saying they set up a rule, right? Like if you kill the master vampire, anyone who hasn't killed yes. can be set free. And this is like, I think a big problem at the end of it. And there's actually an alternate ending that they should start about shooting. Do you know about that? No. So the alternate ending was in the scene where Caleb and May are hugging at the end, the light comes in and then Sarah steps into the sunlight and she starts smoking a little bit and then the movie ends. And so the idea was like, Oh, you know, Homer turned her into a vampire. But the reason why they cut it out was because they have the, Deus Ex Machina, which is the transfusion. So they're like, okay, well, even at the end of the movie, if Sarah's been turned into a vampire, it kind of doesn't matter. Right. You know? Yeah, it's kind of weird to me. One thing I think was kind of fun is that freeze frame shot at the very end. Uh What it does to me is like it almost gives May, it makes her seem a little bit remorseful that she has turned back from being a vampire. Because you imagine like, her life was probably cooler as a vampire than it was before this. Cause she reminds me a lot of like my mother, like she was a super hot trailer park denizen who, you know, was picked up by the king of the vampires, Hugh Hefner, when she became a playboy bunny. Right. And she was elevated into this kind of more interesting and exotic life. And I can't imagine in these days, if you ran into some fucking juggalo in the middle of a trailer park and said, Hey man, you want to live forever? You just got to kill some truck drivers. They'd be like, yo, what's up, fam? I'm getting in the RV. You know, (laughs) like, I'm pretty sure that's what would happen. I mean, how I would probably become a murderous vampire, just get out of my copywriting job, you know? (laughs) Uh, Okay, what else have we got? Let's talk a little bit more about, like, the characters and the kind of the character acting of it. Because I thought that was pretty interesting because you don't see, you don't often see directors give actors very much freedom like that and especially not a first time director who had everything on the line i mean i think it speaks a lot to the absolute bravery of catherine bigelow as a director because she wrote this movie and the guy who produced it if you watch the extras if you look up near dark extras on youtube there's like some producer guy he's like well i told her she could shoot it but i'm going to look at the dailies and if the dailies ever suck you're fired i'm going to replace you immediately so she was like not for certain going to be directing this movie and to have given so much control to the actors and so much trust is I think a really interesting choice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. you don't hear about that in point break, you know, it's not like, I mean, I wonder like, did she give Keanu Reeves? Different actors. Yeah. Different actors. <laughs> you know? Yeah, for sure. And it's not as if the actors were just walking all over and doing what, what they wanted with this first time, almost first time director. Mm-hmm. She'd worked, but she'd, collaboratively directed before but not yeah. this is her first solo feature film because if you look at interviews with the actors they all say she knew w- exactly what she wanted mm-hmm. you know they all speak to her um very clear vision of what she wanted but then to be very clear and give um the artist you're collaborating with a lot of freedom is uh really awesome I, are you a fan of her other movies i quite liked zero dark 30 yeah i absolutely adore point break yeah. Like I, I even beyond the kitsch of it, I think it's a really successful action movie and has like, I think one of the things that's distinctive about her movies, and I don't know if this is her writing or like other people make these decisions, but there in each of these movies, there's a thing that you've never seen in another movie before. Like in Point Break, for example, you've never seen a skydiving fight before. You know, now that's a thing in every Mission Impossible movie. Or, you know, there's a scene where, to get away from somebody, a dude literally throws a pit bull. 
at, you know, like one of the, the guy, he throws a pit bull at Keanu Reeves to escape him. I mean, like who even comes up with throwing a dog at somebody? <laughs> it's totally inventive. And then um, I think a lot of the shots in the Hurt Locker were like, there's like really close up shots and just I, the pacing of that movie was really inventive, I thought. I think all of her movies pacing is a really key thing. Like she has the confidence to not have to cram every moment full of action, even though she mostly makes action films. Yeah. And I think that's what makes her action films like, it's not like full on nonstop a hundred miles an hour action. It, it, there's, there's a lot of character development. I mean, as goofy as it fucking is, Bodie and Johnny Utah are really pretty fleshed out characters in Point Break. And it, they're more fleshed out than they should be for a movie of that <laughs> silliness yeah. level. And then she, there's also a lot of, like, even in Point Break, there's a lot of fun moments. Like she lets the characters have fun with each other. And I think that that makes the overall plot just stronger. You know, when he's like, go get me a meatball sandwich, Utah, two, two. You know, he's like, ordering like two sandwiches. It's a weird Gary Busey moment, but it's one of the moments, it's a very memorable moment from it. And, you know, like the killing somebody with spurs, like it's so fucking weird. Yeah. You know, like it reminds me of what I always talk about with drag, where I, every drag performance I see, I'm like, where the fuck would they have even come up with that? Right. You know, it's like I've, I've seen all these same, you know, presumably the same movies. Like I think, for instance, Peaches Christ. I've seen a fuckload of horror movies too, you know, but I would never process them in that way. I, I just, it's miraculous to me. Like, I'm just, I'm just like, man, am, am I just that uninventive or are these people superheroes of imagination? And I just think that Catherine Bigelow must have that too. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. What, what have we not hit? I think I've only got like little scrap notes left. Yeah. Like a lot of my notes for this are just, almost trivia stuff like things to notice like the ponytail that's dipped in tar is just an interesting choice or the fact that you know the fingernails on his hands are sort of a an homage to Nosferatu and he kind of came up with that himself and the whole method acting quality of things like you know when they put up like the whole blacking out of things really quickly I think is really just cool it just makes internal logical sense to this film it's cool and it's slapdash mm. as it would be even yeah. by people who had practiced something like that. And they, they are practiced panicked. it. Yes. Yeah. They came up with the idea and they practiced it and got better and better and better at it. So you've got these actions that rather than they are perfectly rehearsed and executed for camera with precision, they are done by a bunch of people who are continuously improvising mm -hmm. for the camera and with each other doing something as if their lives depended on it. Yeah. And so it's just a mess and it's frenetic and you get that. Yeah. And I also love that the idea came from Elvis. Yes. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's fun. Like, and which immediately made me think of Nick cave because, you know, Nick cave is another performer that plays with the Southern Gothic. You know, and he's from Australia, which is a gigantic, like, I think Australia is just one gigantic Southern continent. Yeah. You know, the whole thing is just Southern. And especially in like Tupelo era, Nick Cave, it's, you know, Tupelo is where Elvis is born. But it, to me, that's an interesting nod to the overarching idea of, of the Southern Gothic. And I, I think that this, you know, this is one of the earliest and strongest pieces of Southern Gothic film I can even think of. And it's just a neat little genre blend. I think another thing that's worth noting about this movie is just how ahead of its time it was for genre blending. You know, when Bill Paxton brought the script to Lance Hendrickson, he was like, it's a vampire Western. And at the time, that must have sounded fucking retarded. Sure. You know, but now... Everything like is two, two genres that are not necessarily cool right at that time. Yeah. And you want to put them both together? Fuck no. You know, and they talk about how like they both want, they wanted to make Westerns. Like Catherine Bigelow was like, I specifically want to make a Western, but nobody was buying Westerns. But I don't, that seems kind of like untrue because, okay, first of all, you have a weird punk rock Western. You have uh, Alex Cox's Straight to Hell, 
comes out, which is kind of like a upending of the genre. But Young Guns comes out like two years later, and then it's on, and there's a whole string of westerns. Right, but like nobody's Silverado. buying. Nobody's buying might be nobody is buying hers. Yeah, yeah. You know, nobody's willing to fund her western project. Yeah, I just have one little scrap note mm-hmm. that I noticed that May is sort of the proto manic pixie dream girl yeah definitely she's pixie haircut yeah well and also she's just sort of like into her own world and you have to sort of adore her for her quirky Mm -hmm. introvertedness and she is has a a lot of inner strength but she's at the same time so delicate and fragile which is all manic pixie dream girl and also a vehicle through which the protagonist can transform their own identity through this person who is self-contained I want to talk about the music, the Tangerine Dream soundtrack, which is, as I said earlier, half the time it's perfect. It's like atmospheric and slow and brooding, just like the cinematography, just like the pacing of this film. But then the other half of the time it's donk, ticka, ticka, donk. It just does not work in a Western and it does not work at all. And what that is, is Tangerine Dream were this incredible uh, electronic band very connected to the kraut rock movement they they made this very minimal drifting ambient music with analog synths Mm -hmm. for a long time and they got really terrible in the 80s they did some good soundtrack work but as a band they started incorporating sort of the worst of 80s synthesis they started using i'm just going to be really nerdy for just a moment they started using the dx7 which was fm synthesis in ways that have not aged well They were very novel at the time. Mm. It was an amazing synthesizer, but so much of what it could produce sounds cheesy. Sounded cheesy then and sounds cheesy now. It probably sounded cool for five minutes. I think the songs, the Skinny Puppy albums that are are not as good really heavily use that synth. Probably. Yeah. I, I would probably agree with what you're referring to. And it's unfortunate that the thing that happened to Tangerine Dream that made them a less interesting band is exactly demonstrated in the soundtrack of this movie is that when the music is not good it's a that cheesy attacky synth sound what a bummer and it also doesn't work it's it has, not atmospheric it's not brooding it's it's just cool and flashy and 80s. Yeah. yeah but also like uh, you educated me on what like attack was last week and then yeah. I immediately i started thinking about it a lot and uh, maybe you should explain it real quick before. Attack on a yeah. synthesizer? Mm-hmm. It's the way a, a, a sound comes on. So just think when you hit uh, a cymbal, it goes crash, right? Uh, it at The attack, the, the first instance of sound from when you hit that cymbal is sudden. It gets very suddenly loud as opposed to, let's say, if you drew a bow across a violin slowly, it's a long attack. It, mm. it, it fades in. A sharp attack, there's no fade in. And uh, a lot of punchy bass synth sounds, there's virtually no attack. It just hits really hard. Yeah. So what it made me think of, like, the bad moments of the soundtrack have, like, the same springiness of the Seinfeld soundtrack, of the Seinfeld theme. Yeah. That oh, yeah, yeah. It, Absolutely. It, it's just, like, it's really off-putting. Yep. If you were to rescore this movie... Do you think you would go with synths again, or do you think you would go with more like a like traditional like horror orchestral? I think I would go updated Morricone. I think I would go mm. with I would I would go with the surf rock guitar tone into atmospherics. Although that would definitely be making it retro. I was about to say uh, it's an interesting choice for you because it's borderline retro mania. But, but are that. we talking about? If I was scoring it in eighty seven, if if I had twenty twenty hindsight, no, somebody, in 87, I'm saying right that like if we did a fun YouTube thing and we like we took this movie and we removed the soundtrack, but I don't know even how, how the fuck you would do that. Yeah. But if you removed the soundtrack and added a soundtrack into it that would improve the movie, what would you do? I think I would still rely on some of those tropes and figure out how to make them not so. Uh, retro, uh, which is virtually impossible because of the, mm. by very nature, I'm describing something that is, you know, if you describe it, people know what that is because it's ingrained as a trope in soundtracks. But I think that would, for me, would be the starting place. The the twangy uh, spring reverb surf guitar playing 
sort of uh, uh, dolorously mm -hmm. and then see where that can go as a starting place. I think that'd be actually kind of a cool album, just like having like a little, like really sparse, like synth drum with like kind of a echoey reverb guitar over it or something like that. It could be bad. It could be awesome. It could, who knows? We'll work on it. Yeah. Well, I'm not doing that. I have no musical talent at all. Um, two questions. You join this gang. Yeah. One, who do you want your vampire progenitor to be of, of the gang? Who do I want to turn me? Yeah. Probably Hooker because mm -hmm. I sort of feel like I would want his tutelage. Yeah. You know, I would want, I would want him having my back directly. Yeah. Yeah. You? But if he fucked up, he'd be, I mean, obviously Jesse Hooker for me too. I mean, although I could also probably. But I'd have to stay in line, right? Yeah. He would, he would make me a better vampire. I mean, he just, he's made it this long. Mm -hmm. uh, although who knows how many vampires he's gone through. Yeah. The, the, over over the decades and centuries. I, yeah, this is one of those films like Nightbreed that I wish I could just like open up this you just get into it a little bit more and just explore it a little bit more. Like if this was a an HBO series, you know, I just wish that this this would be there. Speaking of HBO series, which, I, which uh, quickly, yeah. they leave you wanting more, which is such a yeah. good part of this movie. Yeah. They don't oh, they don't explain shit. You just get a glimpse and you just want more and then it's over. And I love that about it. But sorry, HBO. Yeah. You know, you could see this movie like being more of a series, which made me think of like, you know, True Blood, the other Southern vampire property. I was trying to think of like, oh, you know, they must have borrowed something from this movie for that. But not so mm. much. I, you know, I, I only watched True Blood. I didn't watch it all the way through. I just watched up until a fucking were creature showed up and then I tapped out. It was oh, just it, too stupid it, to me. It kept it. it it didn't even stop there. It got more wily. Yeah, I am not, other than what we do in the shadows, which I think is just unimpeachable, I'm not a fan of there's vampires, so there must be all kinds of different other dark creatures. Right. And to me, this was the downfall of the uh, vampire role-playing game, Vampire the Masquerade, which it, it wouldn't be a Scary Thoughts vampire episode without bringing up this <laughs> fucking role-playing game. But I think when that storyline in that world was very focused on vampires... It was excellent, but there's a moment when they had fucking mummies. You know, it's just absolutely r ridiculous, oh. and you're like, "Oh, this is like just jumping supernatural sharks left and right." But I definitely feel like that property, this movie, really influenced really heavily. I think that might be explicitly the case. I believe they were on the table about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like the the main the artist that everybody knows from that series, who is actually a really phenomenal artist, Tim Bradstreet. You know, he has characters that look just like Severn. You know, and and like they're it's just very cool, very like you know. There's something about '80s punk rock. There was a bit of a Western flair sometimes to some of it. Like you know, I remember people wearing duster coats and weird shit like that. Not me out there. Fields of the Nephilim. Yeah, that, that's exactly that. I was, could not remember the name of that band the other day. I was trying to think of. Like, I saw who them it was. live. They were great. Were they? Oh yeah. I haven't listened to them in so long. I remember really quite liking them. I think that people who used to listen to them have gone fifty fifty, half thinking they've aged horribly and can never listen to them again, and half think like it holds up really, really well. Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to. I'll have to give them a look this weekend and see. What would your hunting method be? But specifically, like if you were in this gang in this movie, oh, okay. So yeah. I can't be. It can't be the library after hours. No, I would have to be with <laughs> yeah. this 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 yeah. pack. Okay. Um. Oh God. Do you have one? The interesting thing is that they're on the highway all the time. So I feel like it would have behooved them to stage accidents. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, I, I feel like they could be like, oh, this person crashed and they went through the windshield and they bled out. I think that that would probably be pretty good. But I like the idea of, you know, feeding on the underworld, like going into a biker bar and challenging somebody to a fight and just fucking them up. The, um, the, the inverse of From Dusk Till Dawn. Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. Although it might be interesting in keeping with this movie but not staying with the pack if you just went from truck driver to truck driver. Each night, you would be a truck driver, but yeah. you wouldn't have your own rig. Yeah. You would just prey on a truck driver, take the rig, drive it somewhere else, dump the body, yeah, jump rigs. And that could also be a way to make money somehow. Yeah, I don't know. You could unload property at night. I don't know. I guess. 
you don't need money if you're a vampire. One thing I thought was worth noting is that the rule, we always talk about rules of engagement and it's kind of funny because in the last few episodes, I, I think in our last episode, we talked about how it's like, oh, the rules of engagement, eh, that thing kind of wasn't really a thing for us. It didn't really work out. But there are rules here. Like one of the things that I think is especially fun about, about vampires is that there's always a rule set. Like there, and it's very, and it always really has a heavy hand in how the characters act. And this one, they're forced to kill because if they just had a little sip and didn't kill the person, the person becomes a vampire. So that's kind of like you couldn't just have like your blood bag that you just hang around. I wonder though if they were to like just cut somebody's wrist and drink the blood. Oh, there you go. Yeah, like that would be a way around it. Vampire hack. Yeah, yeah. Life hacks for vampires. Death hacks, I guess is what it would <laughs> be called. Hacks. Yeah, maybe we should have a blog called Death Hacks. It's oh. just like reverse life hacks. Oh, man. It's got to be done. Somebody has to have done it. Okay, we're going to look this up. Yeah, we'll have to look. We're going to see. And there's like some, there's like 40,000 comment deep Reddit thread about it. You know, <laughs> some crazy shit. More importantly than your method of killing them, you roll with this vampire gang. What is your outfit? Because they all have a look, right? And it, it, I like that this is a very old West thing is you would have just like one set of clothes. Yeah. And it sort of became your whole thing. Like it's, it's actually a thing. I'm reading the sisters brothers right now. And there's these scenes where they kind of get outfitted at different points. And it's a very eighties montage thing where you kind of put your outfit together before you go off and do the thing, even in pretty woman, right? Like there's the whole scene where she becomes not a hooker through the power of commerce. (laughs) I think actually this, this might be an answer to both questions. Mm -hmm is something that could be interesting to do is choose a victim, take their clothes. I only kill people that are my size and then I take their clothes <laughs> and I try to be them until I kill the next person because I have nothing to lose. You know, you walk into a bar and you're going to kill everybody. Well, tonight I'm that last guy I killed and just constantly be method acting mm-hmm. <laughs> as a vampire just to fucking make eternity not so boring and make killing not so rote. It would be maybe sort of an extension of trying new recipes. I'm going to kill as a truck driver. I'm mm-hmm. going to kill as a police officer, you know? That's all I got. Yeah. I think my I, I think my outfit would look a lot like my one of my favorite people in the world and one of my personal heroes, uh, Detective Eric Alarmo, one of my buddies on the homicide team in New Orleans. He He basically wears like really nice cut black suits, with like white shirts, big crisp white shirts, kind of reservoir dogish, but with like Western elements. So he he'll wear like a bolo tie and he has like cowboy boots and he's such a fucking trip. And his his police issue AR fifteen he keeps in a, in a guitar case. Just it, it, I just love that he's out there and is such a weird, interesting dude. Yeah. He's got like kind of like a rockabilly haircut. Uh, I think that would be a good look for rolling around this gang. Definitely. Well, two other thoughts. One is you can't you can't go wrong with a duster. It's a cape. You, it yeah, looks it, awesome at yeah. night. You just period. Mm-hmm. It's fucking scary and mesmerizing. It also might make sense to have a duster where you don't wear it all the time, but if you know you're going to kill, you zip up and then you just get mm-hmm. blood on the duster and then you hose it off and you don't have to clean your cl- blood off your actual clothes. But maybe another approach would be to go the whole 2018 tactical route. So what yeah. is what fabric does blood come out of the best or is the most blood slash liquid resistant fabric and you just wear that because if you're only going to wear one set of clothes you want that set of clothes to be perfect yeah but these like vampire, military precision yeah i get i thought about that too because like why wouldn't you want a hoodie you yeah. know these motherfuckers don't have watches and they're constantly getting caught in the sun you know, <laughs> so it's like you would think maybe like a nice hoodie that came like a tad gear hoodie or even something. I mean, the cool thing would be just go to Nice Collective and say, look, guys, this is what I'm up to. I need you to make me some fucking clothes. I can only meet you at night. Yeah. No, totally. God, you could also just have a full bodysuit made of oven mitt, like fire retardant. Just dress like a fucking fireman. Yeah. And walk around oh, and be a daywalker. I, I changed my, my answer. Okay. I would wear a fucking nudie cowboy suit. 
What's that? So those suits that you see, like cowboy stars, where they have all the shit all over them, like the rhinestones and the designs, and like a cactus, like a. Uh, Graham Parsons. You remember yeah. the outfits that Graham Parsons sure. wore? Just like embroidered roses. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. That's what I would wear. I would wear nudie suits. Why is it called a nudie suit? Because the guy who made him was like Jack oh, okay, Nudie. Okay. Nudie. His last name was Nudie. I can't remember his first name. Oh, yeah. Do that. Those look amazing. Yeah. I kind of want one now. My wife would be so fucking against it. She's such a square. Wear it other days. What? Yeah. I don't know. As soon as she leaves, just put it on and watch TV. <laughs> Yeah, I I think next year is the year I finally buy a Harley. And once I do, I'm probably going to have to change my outfit to, to biker guy. I think you have to you get some chaps and stuff. God, That's another thing. Like, uh, I think, you know, Diamondbacks chaps make total sense, you sure. know. Let's get to the rules of engagement a little bit. You know, things we know about these vampires. Crosses don't work. Sunlight totally fucks them up. Garlic, probably not a thing. They are cowboys, but bullets don't kill them gorgeous irony yes but bullets do injure them like they do get fucked up from them although not for very long so i'm thinking like i feel like severin could have survived like blowing up in a truck doesn't seem like it would have been a and in, in, like it, it feels like a burnt to crisp severin could have survived if you poured some blood on him you know so it's like okay what is the limit of the amount of damage is he like deadpool style where he could just come back together and he can grow back a, grow back his tiny little legs yeah i don't know what sort of weapons would you carry around if you were a vampire? Would you one of these guys? Well, being a weapons expert, that is a really difficult question to answer, Chad. I don't know. Yeah, uh, like, like uh, a gun. I don't know. Well, I mean, like, like an you could say like an axe or a gun. Or, oh no, I think I think having a good knife, a good rifle, and a good handgun. What I, you know, these are sensible weapons. A knife is good for getting blood. And close quarter, you know. And I think you're like I'm inventing a genre, the tactical vampire. But that's kind of underworld, right? Um, that is not a good movie. Yeah. Kate Beckinsale is not hard to look at, though. That's, I think that's why we know about that movie. Yeah. All right. Should I ask, what have we learned? What have we learned? I think it's better to be a vampire in the South. It's a good place for it. Yeah. Rather be in New Orleans as yeah. a vampire, New I mean, Orleans atmospherically. Is, I mean, New Orleans is kind of the perfect vampire city. It doesn't really get much better than that. I mean, it's the reason why all these clowns set their vampire stories in New Orleans. It's also like in the mid '90s. I've talked about this on the show before, but there were people who were basically vampire juggalos, you know, who just came to New Orleans to live the vampire lifestyle and and absorb it. And it's kind of interesting. I, I, there was a period of time where. I was completely disinterested in vampires. I was just like, man, I'm over this shit. I've just spent too much time thinking about it. But I feel like I'm interested again. Yeah. They're the best. Um, I think we need a stronger ending here. Okay. (laughs) 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 Okay. Email us at whatthe at scarythoughts.org. Join our mailing list at scarythoughts.org. And go see Mandy and check out our next episode. All right. Thank you later, bloodsuckers. Thanks for listening. Ah, fuck it. I lost my train of thought.